did it already. They told me I have to stand here and this is going to be painful for me and maybe painful for you. So I'll just apologize in advance. So we have about an hour. I believe it's plenty of time. Um, I, I'm just going to, full disclosure, um, this is not my area of expertise. Um, I believe that it is a very, very neglected area, which is why I'm here to talk to you about it. I did do a lot of research. I feel like I know a lot more now than I have before. And um, I, I do know a lot about it from a observer of the need, for sure. And so um, I hope that we'll be learning a little bit together here. And, uh, and my hope is that we have some next steps. So I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, get engaged with me. And the first thing I'd like you to do is um, I'm going to ask you when I say go, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to ask you to <laughs> greet two people that are in another row, preferably like behind you. And, and just tell them, tell them your name and just say, I have an intention for this session. Like, I, I have something I want to get out of it, and this is it. Okay? So, um, I, I have this little thing here. See, don't start kissing when I do that, okay? <laughs> just, come, just come to a close. I know that's what we do in these hotels, right? We start kissing. <laughs> just come to a close, and, and we'll move on, okay? Okay, ready? Uh, anyone want to clarify the instructions? Okay, so share your name and an intention with two people. Go. Okay, thank you. Um, that was our connection activity. And, um, now we're going to do an activity to unite us. Um, I'd like to uh, see if this group could count to 10 collectively. Okay, so this is what, how it will work. Someone will start with one. one. And, uh, let me finish the instructions. <laughs> we know who's going to start with one. And then uh, someone will say two and three. And, and then if two people talk at the same time, we'll start back at one. All right? Oh, let's just see if we can do it. It'll be fun. All right. So we're ready. One, two, three, four, five. Oh. All right. All right. Let's start again. Let's start again. One, two. Oh, let's start again. One, two. Oh, well, let's start again. Regulate, regulate. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, okay, well, that's pretty good. We did pretty good. We got to six. This is a really hard task for even a group of seven people. So we did really well. And uh, I'll just give yourself a little uh, applause there. All right. So um, I think I picked kind of a funny picture for this because like the captions like what about the adults and it's like look at them they're all protesting. Um, I, I know that person in the white hat that's kind of funny. Uh, I do. You do? Who is that? Maggie Miller. Yeah. I didn't know I couldn't remember who it was. Isn't that great? Okay anyway. So um, <laughs> Yeah, so anyways, I, I really want to talk about strengthening adult social emotional learning, which is the title of the talk, so I should talk about that. Um, and uh, th this should look familiar, right? We're going to build the wheel right now. We're going to build the wheel, okay? So the first thing in the wheel are the actual competencies. There are five of them, and, and, and indicated by these pie-shaped things, right? Um, Talk to your neighbor. See if you can come up with three. Hurry. Okay, who's got one? I mean, you know, like one of the competencies. Responsible decision making. Responsible decision making. You know what color it is up there? Green. Green. I, I can't do it because it's number five. <laughs> I'm not going to click. I mean, what do you expect? Okay. 
but it's green. Okay, so the, the orange colors, they go together for a reason. What are those? Self-management. Self-management and? Self-awareness. All right, so now we've got the blue. The blue have to do with others. What are those? Social awareness. Social awareness. Relationships. All right, so there are five competencies. Those are the competencies I did. Am I, is my voice grating? Should I turn it down? Okay, okay, I'm gonna calm down a little bit. Sorry. Okay, so these are the competencies identified by the Collaborative Association for Social Emotional Learning, otherwise known as CASEL or, or CASEL. I don't know how you say it really, I say CASEL. But anyway, um, the, the thing that I think is really interesting about it is I'm gonna submit to you that for many schools, th this is the implementation right here. We've got the identification of some competencies and then we've got a curriculum and we're doing some instruction, and that's it. Well, the collaborative, uh, how many people are familiar with CASEL? Okay, good. So you're gonna recognize a lot of these materials. One of the reasons why I really wanted to draw on their materials is because I think that they are a resource that is hugely underutilized. And one of the reasons why I think it's underutilized is it's a little overwhelming because it is so comprehensive. It is so thorough. So you're like looking at it and you're going, you know, we don't have the next decade, right? I mean, you heard Susan talk about this today, right? However, I really do believe that some of us are moving too fast, okay? And that being said, I don't think that there's any reason why we can't just take a step back and keep doing some things that we're doing. Like the students are getting instruction with curriculum that many of us purchased through a grant. And, and that's, I, I'm just gonna say, like that's one of the reasons why we move fast is because a lot of these projects are grant funded, right? And, and like we plan the whole grant and then all of a sudden we've gotta like start doing the stuff, right? And of course there's the whole thing where, like why we're writing the grant, we're like, well, we'll figure it out if we get it. And then it's like, oh my God, we got it. <laughs> Now we have to figure it out and do it at the same time, right? Am I right? This is how higher ed works, right? Okay, so anyway, so we got curriculum instruction, we're doing that, we're doing that. Now, what I think a lot of times we're not doing is paying a whole lot of attention to school-wide practices and policies that support social emotional competencies. All right, and they are implicated. I mean, it's not really, um, you know, it's not, it's not really, uh, how do you say that? It's not really a mistake, no, that's not it. But it's not really um, like just, just chance, chance. It's not really chance that I picked that picture. I mean, right now the reality is some of the policies are really messing with teachers' emotional wellness, right? So policies and practices are implicated. You know, many of you have heard Dr. Lori talk about you can't really do good social emotional learning instruction without taking a really serious look with how you're doing discipline. We cannot continue to exclude for dysregulation. We, if we say that these competencies are a domain of school, can we throw kids out for not meeting the competencies? If we talk out of both sides of our mouth, we can. Did you see how I said that? That was, okay. Then the other thing is there are implications for community partnerships and family partnerships, right? And, and right now I think that the, this, this final ring here, this outer ring here of family and community partnerships is really in the distance for many of us, right? All right, now uh, what I have superimposed here are Indiana's social emotional learning competencies. And if you look on the DOE site, you'll see that five of them walk right over to the five castle competencies. And then two were added, right? Mindset, 
and sensory motor and integration. And, and they both work lovely and they represent more of a sort of a, a slant towards neuroscience, which I think is a good thing. Um, however, the, this, this, this image is a lot harder to work with, so I just threw it up here. Like, I didn't build anything around it, right? So you can see it, and there aren't any really good images right now to pull. They're all, like, really pixelated, so I'm going to talk to people about that and get some good images. <laughs> well, I mean, like, we want to use them, right? And we're not going to use them if they look like this. See, I'm using it on you, and you're probably sitting there thinking, does she really care about us? She's using an image that's just poor, right? Okay, I do. All right. So, so Castle has this thing called the Collaborating Districts Initiative, and they've partnered with some districts, and, and their goal, you know, they have a lot of goals, but one of the goals is to sort of find out, like, what happens when you do high-quality SEL implementation. That's kind of one of their goals, right? But a a another goal is, like, what are the necessary district supports to make this happen at the school level and what are the school supports? So their work is largely about the outer rings, okay? Because what they're trying to figure out is, is, is not just like what happens when you do high quality implementation, but how do we get high quality implementation, right? Okay, so this is really important. So you can kind of see some of the findings. I mean, it's really important for us to communicate to everyone that, you know, social emotional learning is not separate from academics. And if I hear one more time, we don't have time, I, I don't know, I don't know what I'll do, quite frankly. No, um, you know, I mean, the thing is, is we don't not have time. We don't not have time. And, and the reality is that we're, we're, we're really fooling ourselves if we think the only path if we think the only path to high academic achievement is interacting with academic content, we are wrong. Okay? So, um, and then you can see some other uh, findings from the collaborative districts initiative. Suspensions and expulsions went down, which is always a good thing. And, and if, if indeed instruction is happening in the classroom, this automatically increases the level of instruction that's going on. If instruction is happening, and we have every reason to believe that it is. And, and then students feel safer and more connected, and of course that's hugely important. And then also that we saw raising uh, uh, levels of graduation attendance and, and GPA. But in my mind, this last one is just as important, that teacher effectiveness increased. And, and teacher effectiveness is largely measured by teacher efficacy. You know, people feel like I have what it takes to support the growth of this student. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in a minute, too. Okay, I have to look at my time. Okay, oh, oh my God, okay. So, all right, so here's what happens. The, the castle work, they lay out some district stuff, and then they lay out some school stuff. And, and, and they're not separate, but I'm going to present them a little bit separate. Because I'm going to submit to you that probably very few of you in this room that are implementing social emotional learning have started with central office staff. I'm just saying. Maybe you have. But the idea is that we build actual expertise among central office staff. We help them understand what kind of outcomes are associated with social emotional learning, what the competencies are, um, sort of good development, just kind of like the training that teachers would go through, right? And then um, we actually work on their own development of the competencies and cultural competence, because cultural competence is very much a piece of the competencies, right? And then some professional learning for all of the district staff. And of course, it's not going to be solely in the curriculum, right? I mean, there's going to be something to do with the curriculum, but it's going to be largely about policies, practices, right? And those kinds of supports. And then staff trust, community, and efficacy. And this is the one I want to spend a little time on. You're already sitting too long, I'm, I apologize. Okay, so here's, here's a chance to participate. What do you think it takes 
to promote staff trust. District office, school building, talk to your neighbor. Two things that it takes to build staff trust. Talk to each other. All right, anyone want to throw anything out here? Maybe you um, have uh, adults and leaders in your district that are building trust. What are they doing? Okay, then what did you say? <laughs> yes, Hannah. Oh yeah, that follow through, that being reliable, right? Excellent. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, uh, very, very important, right? That we have a safe space to, uh, for our own vulnerability and risk taking and making mistakes. Making mistakes is, are gonna be part of this journey every day. Um, one thing that I think is really important is that, you know, to feel trust, those around you, your leadership, to feel trust is essential to building new skills. We do not build new skills without trust. We don't take on new learning without trust. And those things are gonna be essential to any sort of school change endeavor, any sort of. The other thing, and, and this is why like, you know, we've got this outer ring, it's not enough to just do teacher well-being and teacher competencies. We've got to look at the sense of community that staff feel. And I, I want to make a distinction here. Climate refers to perception and feeling about how things feel, right? And culture are those behaviors, practices, uh, policies, beliefs, right, that actually make us feel that way, right? So that, that's the difference between culture and climate. So like um, I, the, the, the person that introduced me said that I was interested in school climate as, as a mechanism for school change. I, I very much am. In fact, I believe that school climate should probably be our measure. Right, like what do students say about the school? What do adults say about the school? That that should be our measure of success rather than this other stuff that we're using to measure success. Okay, all right. Um, how many of you have ever heard the term collective efficacy? Uh, oh look, someone out there is laughing. They're laughing, do you, do you hear it a lot? You say it a lot, all right. Um, so. How many people feel like they know what this means? Oh, okay, great. Uh, no one raised their hand, but I know they do. They just, they were afraid. They were afraid I was gonna call on them. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, teacher efficacy is one of the most profound predictors of student success. And collective efficacy has been suggested as the predictor of student success. Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with this research, so I can't really talk about it. It's some claims that I've seen out there, but I haven't followed up on it. Um, I will say that it's not just about believing in oneself and believing in one's sort of capacity or competency. It's not just believing that the person next to you is competent. It is really a feeling of being connected in the endeavor. So collective efficacy is about feeling competent, but it's also about feeling part of the effort connected to those around you. Okay, um, all right, we're gonna do a little Kahoot. So if you have your phone, this is the time to get it out or a mobile device. 
And I have never done this during a presentation like this. I mean, I use them all the time. I wanted to do poll everywhere, but I couldn't get it to update. So uh, we're doing this. So I'm going to put the pin up here. I've got four poll questions. It'll just be interesting to see what we say about our, our organizations. Okay, so um, you can go to kahoot.it or if you have the app on your phone, you can go there and just type in the game pin when you get the um, thing. If you put a naughty name in it, I will moderate. I will moderate you. Okay, we got a lot of names coming up. Great. Do we only have 12 though? We're probably, I'm going to wait till we get about 40, 50. I'll wait till we get 80. Um, they're just poll questions, so, you know, it's not a quiz, it's, there's really low stakes. Anyone having trouble and you need, you need some assistance? Okay, should I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, we got a series of poll questions. That's whole child summit. <laughs> I know. How much trust do you have among your staff, including district and building leadership? Very little, some, a fair amount, very much. Well, something's wrong. Okay, there we go. So it looks like quite a bit actually, right? That's great. That's wonderful. Okay, should we do another one? All right. I, that would mean me hitting next, okay. I'm thinking that if you're just in a building, you'd answer it that way, and if you're just at the district level, you'd answer it that way. Oh, great, wonderful participation. You're really on it. That's great. I like it. Ooh, all right. Um, anyone notice anything about the, the text in the red? What do you notice? Yet. Growth mindset. So <laughs> I'm talking about because teacher language is one of those things, right? It's one of those things. I went back and changed that this morning. <laughs> what about collective teacher efficacy? Where are we with that? Not that well, fairly well, well, very well. This is sort of what I expected. 
Um, I feel like a lot of um, schools and a lot of districts right now are really paying attention to this. Um, and, you know, this also is kind of my point. Um, we're hearing a lot about teacher self-care and teacher wellness. And I'm just going to say that, like, helping teachers understand how to be mindful and how to reduce stress and having, like, regulation rooms for teachers, all that is great. All that is great. I believe that if we don't change the culture of buildings, stress will remain exactly where it is right now. And part of that has to be about our time to work together, that being meaningful time, and us really, really getting together um, around common goals. Like one of the questions is, how do leaders promote this trust, community, and collective efficacy? Oh, I forgot to do this at the beginning. So how many of you in this room right now are principals? OK. How many are district leaders? OK, good. This is a great mix. And how many are building level staff? How many are district level staff, but maybe you don't see yourself as a leader? You probably are a leader even though you didn't raise your hand. Okay, so how do leaders promote trust, community, and self-efficacy? Laura, will you read this? So I see norms sometimes posted for particular committees and meetings. I rarely see them posted for the building. Like, how are we going to be together? How are we going to work together in this building? How are we going to be together in this space? And even if I do see those things, what I rarely see is people reflecting on how we're doing. So we might have established some norms and some agreements, but we rarely come back and revisit how it's going. And so it just becomes kind of something that's posted over there, right? And, and I, I really think that without that reflection, they're not really that helpful. Um, Hannah, will you read this? So we need the provision of opportunities if we're going to be able to develop that community and collective efficacy. It's critical. And B, will you read this nice and loud? You're on video. You, you might want to turn around, too, a little bit. Just see. OK. I'm not really sure what we're going to do if we don't get some PD time back. Right. I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure. I don't have a lot of hope that we can go very far forward without getting some more professional development time where we can be together. After school, people are exhausted. And people have lives, right? One of the schools I'm working with right now, the teacher day, is, is eight hours. It might not be by contract. But if they're there 10 minutes before the kids get there, and they're there 10 minutes after the kids leave, they're there eight hours. And to think that we can do PD after that, that that's just a joke. OK, OK, wait, I'm not going to get negative. OK. Um, all right, Michael, will you read this last one? Ensure regular collection of data on staff perceptions of their work climate and use it for continuous improvement. Excellent. I know that a lot of schools right now are collecting some climate data, maybe for the first time. And um, the real test will be, do we use it, right? Do we use it in an ongoing way to actually make some changes and adjustments to how we do business? So now I want to just talk a little bit. So that was kind of like what's on the ca castle site for district. And let me just say, at district leaders, there are so many nice resources on the castle site. And like I said, it's a little overwhelming. But I really think that going and, and you know, spending a little bit of time to see what's there, you'll get some really nice resources and some really nice tools. Um, 
I know I mentioned, you know, like this notion of training district staff. They, they actually have PowerPoints that you can use. They have some videos that you can use. And it's well laid out with some discussion questions. And so it's, it becomes, um, from a sort of coordinator role, it becomes a lot more doable. So then they present this idea of like, what does it take at the school level? And so now what we see is, you know, there are basically three activities, right? We've got to get ready, we organize, and then we've got to implement, and then we've got to improve. And I think many of us, myself included, where I work right now, we probably didn't spend enough time on organization, like building that commitment, like helping people understand what are we about to do, right? And instead, we maybe jumped in with promoting SEL for students with a curriculum and instruction and hopefully a time to get it done. That's something, right? But what should go along there is strengthening adult social emotional learning. And then the fourth step would be, of course, that continuous improvement cycle. So just a couple uh, sort of pieces of data up here, some research that I know all of you probably know, but teaching is one of the most stressful occupations in the United States. Um, and Stress really affects not only teacher health and well-being, job satisfaction, but job turnover is killing us. And it's not just leaving one district to go to another, it's leaving. Or the health such that, you know, we need so many subs every day. Um, and it is really impacting student outcomes, particularly when you come to turnover and, and substitutes. So it's definitely... Um, you know, something to pay attention to. And then, like, I'll just say, you know, adult social emotional learning is really an emerging field. You are not going to find much research about adult LCL, like how to promote it, um, it's sort of how, how to actually help people cultivate and then practice, how um, people are looking at policies and practices. So for this reason, I think, it's really, really critical that we look at nurturing an environment where these competencies are valued and these competencies are nourished and nurtured, right? Um, so I also believe, like I know this is a, a broken record, but unless we do that, we can do all the sort of mindful Mondays and the, and the um, wellness checks on teachers that we want, but if the environment doesn't ch change, I don't think the stress level is going to change. So there is a lot of research about what happens when we have adults who use the competencies at a, at a high level. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with meta-analysis, but when we see effect sizes of more than a half of a standard deviation, which you see here, this is 0.7, that is huge. That is huge. So we would say that the, the variable of modeling the competencies and developing, thus developing positive relationships, this is a very, very important variable for student growth. Um, and then you'll see uh, this, the research suggests that adult uh, social emotional learning competence has a direct impact on learning and on the environment. And then you'll just see some more stuff here. Um, I, I would submit to you that some of the things in the bold here, student conduct, attachment to school, and academic performance, are those things that we're really struggling with the kids whose behavior we struggle to manage, right? And I really believe that much of that is going to get uh, better in the context of relationships and social emotional learning competencies are just critical for these relationships. Um, we cannot teach kids about emotional regulation and stand in the hall screaming at kids who are misbehaving. Um, you know, it, it, if anything that I learned in, in teaching high school is whatever you say means about this much compared to whatever you do. And um, 
I, I, it, it's just impossible to think that we can impart skills on students that we ourselves are not modeling. Modeling is the most powerful teacher there is. It is more powerful than any other form of teaching. So I just wanted to point out that when we get to the school level and we're talking about strengthening adult SEL at the school level, um, CASEL really lays it out in these three activity areas. We have sort of learning of the competencies and how to become more socially, emotionally competent with better decision making and better relationship skill building and then collaborating and modeling. So I, I'm just going to fly through here the ideas related to, oh yeah, what we need to do in terms of learning. So you'll see some of these things we are doing. Most schools have been involved in looking at cultural competence and examining our biases, right? Some schools are involved with self-care and re-energizing. Um, very few schools are in, and most schools are involved with growth mindset for staff, right? Very few schools are involved with personalized professional learning plans for SEL. Like I evaluate myself and I lay out some plans to get better and hopefully I have an accountability person and we're going to work together on my plan and then I I'm going to work with you on your plan, right? Um, the uh, CASEL offers some real resources around brain-based uh, models for workplace collaboration. It's a, a lot, it would be a lot to go into today. I looked at the materials and I think they're really good and I think we're going to try to use some of them. The next thing is collaborating and really, again, we're about you know, creating conditions for students to engage in social emotional learning, we need to feel empowered and supported and valued. So the idea is that some, you know, the, the districts will really strengthen staff expertise, if you will, in the area of collaboration and the area of project based working, not only as it relates to students, but as it relates to us right, and help us engage in that. So we have those shared agreements again. Lots of schools are doing PLCs. Lots of schools are starting to do peer mentoring and uh, partnerships through master teachers and mentor teachers. Um, many, we, we integrated some social emotional learning today into our professional development. We had a connection activity, we had a unite activity, and then I attempted to engage you through asking people to read and we did the poll. I, I'm just pointing all these things out so you know that I'm paying attention. And, um, it, but, you know, the article that came out recently, I forget when it was, but I, I shared it with the principals that I'm working with, you know, to see if they wanted to uh, um, continue the conversation, you know, like starting every staff meeting with some social emotional learning competency building is like really important. Um, and then, of course, we've got peer consultancy protocols, whether it's through TAP or through the um, National School Reform Faculty. This area right here, I feel like we're the furthest on. I, I don't know, how many people feel like your district might be the furthest on this? No, okay then. Um, <laughs> and then, and then um, this last one, I think, is the one that th there aren't always a lot of uh, supports for. Um, so I will say that CASEL has taken their SEL adult assessment and then they have sort of identified what all the competencies would look like in terms of teacher behaviors and teacher dispositions. And then also, they have identified ways in which you would demonstrate that on a daily basis. So um, the, the modeling is, is the activity here. Um, I'm going to show you a little of the research on gratitude and creating that culture of appreciation, how important that is, and then um, some practices for leaders. So uh, really quickly, uh, what I'd like you to do, we have about five minutes for this, and we'll be right on time, which is excellent. Um, 
You have about five minutes. The first thing I'd like you to do is just get together with three or five people around you. Um, divide the SEL competency. So if you have five, you'll each have a competency. If you only have three, then you're going to have to double down on your work. And then just write down three to four concrete examples of how adults could model the competency, like in a, in a day to day situation, how could they model the competency of self management? Okay? And then uh, we'll do a little share out. And then I would like you to, in your group, have a little discussion about which social emotional learning competency do you model well and which one could you do better with? Okay, so I mean, you've got about five minutes for this. We probably won't get it done, but take a stab at it. Take a stab. Three to five people around you. Fire up. It's the afternoon. It's hot in here. Okay. If I could have you come back together. Um, so it, here's something that I, I firmly believe is that part of this work is going to be creating classroom environments that are more conducive to social emotional learning. And I'm not just talking about the instruction and the curriculum. I'm talking about creating the environment and the climate, right? And you could see how if we're doing trigger inventories with students, we should be doing them also, and it should be a part of morning meeting. You know, this is a topic for discussion and a topic that we have and come back to. And that, that's a way to do it in the context of also teaching students, right? We just do it with them. Um, the, the other thing that I'm reminded by is a person that is kind of a recovering behaviorist um, and has done, you know, a lot of work with a sort of technology of behavior. Um, let me just say, like, you know, we often, we know the process of identifying setting events, you know, those things that are kind of more distant in time, things that we don't have a lot of control over. And, like, sometimes people say, well, why identify them if we can't change them? Well, if I know that I'm stressed out, the reality is I can change the activities that I might be doing that day. I might not be able to change whatever it is that's stressing me out, right? But I can change some of the activities that I'm going to engage in on those really high stress days, just like we should be able to for students. Anything else? All right, well, we're coming up on just six minutes. So uh, I did put in the description the word principles, so I put it on a slide. Um, <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I, I really wanted to do a session kind of just for principals, and then I thought, well, what if no principals come, <laughs> right? And so I did really try to focus on district leadership and obviously sort of building policies, practices, culture, which the, the principal is going to be the driver of that. Um, you know, I, we hear this again and again and again, but we teachers spin a lot of plates simultaneously. You know, they look like those Chinese acrobats with all those plates, except th they drop a lot of them. Um, it, you know, because they're not circus performers. Um, but, you know, one thing I would say is that I think principals in my world are getting a lot better at prioritizing. And district leaders are getting a lot better at prioritizing. And, you know, the thing is, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, right? And so I think prioritizing, you know, SEL as in, in being able to devote time to it to learn and plan, and then explicitly modeling those competencies, um, including staff and decision making and making sure our teams are representative of the faculty. And then we've got to figure out how to create some protected time for collaboration. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I know we need it. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to share is that just in terms of supportive sort of meeting space and professional development time and collaboration time, Castle suggests, and, and, and you'll find this in other um, sort of frameworks, I mean this is not unlike some of the brain smart start with conscious discipline or some of the like, I, I, I don't know what all the terms are called, but you know, responsive classroom, second step, um, 
conscious discipline all has this idea like you start your day in the same way. You unite, you connect, right? You move, you de-stress. And the idea is that we would start every meeting with some welcome rituals. And this is part about regulation. I know as a staff member exactly how the meeting's going to start. It's going to start with a connection activity and a unite activity, right? Um, and then that meetings are engaging, that people actually engage, you know, it's not a memo meeting, right? Um, and, and that we find effective ways to do that. And then that we have some optimistic closures. So like, what's the next step? What are you excited about? What are you scared about? That we spend some time reflecting on that, which we have three minutes to do. Okay. So I did want to present this. I know some of you know, you know, you've heard about the really positive effects of gratitude. There are a lot of brain studies. The Greater Good uh, Berkeley Center studies gratitude at, at, at length. And um, the reality is, uh, so they did this study of 300 students seeking mental health services. So the thing that's really cool is they did this study not on people that are well, but on people that are saying, I'm not well, okay? And they separated them into three groups. One group wrote a letter of gratitude. The other group did no writing and then uh, the other group, the second group actually wrote about negative emotions. And uh, you can guess what happened, right? The, the group that wrote letters to people experienced all kinds of really good outcomes. And I, I'm just going to highlight a couple things. The, the, the idea is that writing, the idea is that we have to process gratitude. Like making a checklist or a list is not enough. So in writing, they were processing. They were saying what, what you did that I'm thankful for or how my life would have been different had I not met you or you had not done this thing for me. So there was this processing and it turns out that processing is really important. And it didn't matter if people didn't share the letter. They didn't even have to say anything to anyone. That didn't matter as long as they processed it, the effects were there. And they think really that it just unshackles us from toxic emotions. It took me about 10 minutes to make that little clip art thing there. <laughs> That's unshackling of toxic emotions. And then, um, and then the other thing is, I want you to know that these effects lasted over time. In fact, they weren't even immediate, but they showed up a little bit later, which is really interesting. But what is even more interesting is the effects got greater as time went on. The mental health effects of gratitude got greater as time went on. There are very few interventions that do that. Okay, and then I, I just want to point out the prefrontal cortex was the actual area that was um, uh, changed. Okay, I, I've got one more thing here. You can look this up on air. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to uh, do an optimistic closure. And the optimistic closure is I'd like you to turn to the person next to you, and I think most of you, it's going to be someone you know or someone that you just met at least. What's one thing, what's one thing that you might take back to someone that's not here from this session, if anything? I mean, if there's nothing, you could just say, well, it was real warm. <laughs> but is there something that you'll take back and share that? And then, and then I, I'll, I'll say goodbye to you in a second. So just take that minute. Okay, it's 3.15, and um, I know how these conferences go. I'm not supposed to go over my time, so I don't want to do that. I did find something really interesting that I hadn't seen before, and I'm on the Castle site all the time. I use a lot of the tools, but I found this, uh, I found this playbook, and I hadn't seen it. I, I, I used the SEL um, playbook from Playworks, but I hadn't seen this one from Castle. And, uh, it, you know, it might be helpful if people don't have a, a much of a curriculum. And th there's some really nice activities that you could just build into your, your day with students or into faculty meetings. So, you know, check it out. It's pretty easy to look at. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for your work with kids. I want to thank you for your work with colleagues. And um, thanks for coming to this room. Yep, thank you.